Hello everyone, and welcome to After Alexander, episode 17, Founder of Cities. A quick notice before we start. I've managed to create an official poll for the Alexander the Great question that I put to you all on January 7th. The link to this poll is in the description for that episode, so if all goes well, you should be able to vote on it now. I'm planning to release more of these in the future, so watch this space. So, welcome to the first of four episodes which will be a bit of a break from the main narrative. This week, I thought I'd take a look at the cities founded by Seleucus I until his death in 281. As I've mentioned in the past, Seleucus would found 31 cities in his new empire over the course of his life, which was very much in keeping with the theme of city building that Alexander had started and the other successes had continued. This will specifically be a brief overview of some of the cities Seleucus founded, with a focus on one region we haven't covered before, the Syrian Tetrapolis. I'm going to leave a discussion of Seleucia on the Tigris for a later date, as it's chronologically more suitable as a topic for the reign of Antiochus I, so we'll just be focusing on those four cities for now. It will perhaps not astonish you to learn that the reason this region is called the Tetrapolis is because there were four cities which were central to the region. These cities can be visualised as forming the four corners of a roughly rectangular shape in the northwest corner of Syria by modern-day Turkey. Antioch on the Orontes is in the northeast corner, Seleucia in Pyria by the coast in the northwest, Laodicea in the southwest corner by the coast, and Apamea in the southeast. This region would be a heartland to the Seleucids throughout their history. So, let's examine these cities in a bit more detail. Apamea, which sat on the right bank of the Orontes River, had actually not originally been founded by Seleucus. Rather, it had been the brainchild of Antipater and Cassander all the way back in 320, when it had been founded under the name of Pella. If there are any of you who still recognise that name, this is because it was, this was also the name of the capital of Old Macedon over in Europe. This foundation by Antipater and Cassander is a relatively recent storyline, as it had previously been believed that either Alexander the Great or Antigonus had founded the city. However, it now seems to be attributed to Antipater. Anyway, Seleucus eventually got his hands on it along with the rest of Syria, and in 300 BCE he fortified the place and gave it the status of polis, which is Greek for city. This is quite an upgrade for a foundation which had started out as a Macedonian army camp when it had been founded in 320. With this upgrade, Seleucus also gave it a shiny new name, Apamea, named for his Sogdian wife Apama. The city, which sat in a bend in the Orontes River, became a hub for eastern trade and a major city within the empire. In fact, even after the Seleucids fell, it would be an important Roman city, being the home of the Second Legion from 218 to 234 CE. Even when the Islamic conquest of the 7th century ejected Rome from the region, Apamea would be rebuilt under its new name of Famia, and would survive all the way until 1152, when an earthquake finally demolished it. The second city we should probably discuss is Antioch. Antioch on the Orontes would become, as I mentioned in previous episodes, the capital of the Seleucid Empire when Seleucus shifted his focus west. The privileged rank of capital had originally been that of Seleucia on the Tigris, founded near Babylon, but the honour shifted westwards along with Seleucus's geopolitical attention. An account from the 4th century writer Libanius held that Alexander the Great had once camped on the site which would become Antioch, and had dedicated an altar to Zeus there, in what would later become the northwest of the city. However, although it is possible that Alexander did indeed build this altar, it is also possible this was a fabrication, in an attempt to bring prestige to the region of Antioch. 
as we've seen, the post-Alexander world was not above a bit of romanticising and outright lying as a method of bigging someone up. See all those fake family ties to Alexander the Great for further details. I'm looking at you, Ptolemy. Anyway, I'm going to gloss over two of the other three cities a bit, as we've got the heavy weight of Antioch to deal with. However, the other two cities were still important to the region. Seleucia Pieria was where Antiochus would bury the ashes of his father. Seleucus I went to rest in a building called the Nicotoreion. Seleucia would eventually fall to Roman control, as would the whole of Syria, before eventually being decimated by an earthquake in 526 CE, from which it would never fully recover. Fun fact for you, the city was Christianised early on in Christianity's history, and is in fact still a titular see of the Catholic Church, although it has been vacant since 1980. So, although the city doesn't exist anymore, as I said, it never fully recovered in its capacity as a port after the 526 earthquake, there could still theoretically be a bishop of Seleucia Pieria, which shows how long the shadow of the Seleucids can be. So, on to Laodicea. This was another port further to the south, and would, like its three sisters, be an important city both in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. Although it would be damaged by an earthquake in 494, which seems to be something of a theme with these four, Justinian restored it and made it the capital of the eastern Roman province of Theodorias, which it would remain until the Muslim conquest a century or so later. So, three down and one to go in our overview of the Tetrapolis. Although I've already touched on its foundation a bit, I've saved what is surely the most consequential city of the four until last, Antioch on the Orontes, commonly simplified to Antioch. After Seleucus I control of Syria following the death of Antigonus at Ipsus in 301, he began making plans to found four sister cities in the region, and one of these was Antioch, named in honour of his father, the elder Antiochus who had been a general in the armies of Philip II decades earlier. A ritual was in fact used to choose the site of the city. Specifically, an eagle was given sacrificial meat, and where the eagle landed to eat the meat was the site chosen for the city. Accordingly, Antioch's foundations were laid in May 300 BC, on a grid system, copying this idea from the creation of Alexandria over to the west in the Nile Delta. For example, two main roads intersected each other in the middle of the city, in the way you might have seen Roman army camps laid out in textbooks. I've seen it stated that Antioch would eventually eclipse Seleucia Pieria to become the capital of Syria, so it seems that Seleucia Pieria was the dominant sister of the four for a time. Suffice to say, it didn't stay that way for long, and Antioch would be a dominant city for over a millennium after this. Its prosperity and power came from its control of the roads across Syria, while also being the western end of trade routes for products brought from Persia and further afield, to the rest of the Mediterranean world. Antioch noticeably sticks around for centuries after the fall of the Seleucids. For example, it was re-fortified by Emperor Justinian in the 6th century, who renamed it Theopolis, although this doesn't seem to have stuck, and it would still be crucial at the time of the First Crusade at the end of the 11th century. Antioch was situated, like its sister Apamea, on a bend in the Orontes River which flows into the Mediterranean. A citadel was elected on Mount Silpius, and the main city itself sat on the lower ground to the north of this, lying against the river Orontes. Antiochus I probably created an eastern quarter of the city during his reign, which was where the native Syrians would have lived, in contrast with the Greek portion of the city in the western quarter. Now, this brings me to a point that is important to understand. All of these cities would have been Greek islands, amidst a sea of local people who were decidedly not Greek or Hellenistic at this point. The establishment of new Greek cities, or else the renaming of existing cities to give them suitably Greek names in the eyes of people who ruled them, was a part of the gradual Hellenization of Alexander's empire, and was part of the administrative methods of the Seleucid Empire, 
establish hundreds of settlements which could serve roles in trade or professions. Antioch, for example, as we've said, is on the Orontes River leading into the Mediterranean. Given how vital maritime trade was at this point, you can imagine that Antioch would have been placed there for strategic reasons, or at least with them in mind. As these new points on the map also adopted Greek philosophy and thought, whether of their own accord or by force, admittedly, the process of slowly Hellenising the former empire was helped. Why was this possible? Well, Greece was actually overpopulated at the time, meaning that the vast and sparsely populated expanses of the Seleucid Empire would have been fair game. Colonisation of Seleucid land by Greek cities both benefited the Greeks and furthered the assimilation of the peoples the Seleucids ruled over. What we begin to see at this point is a halfway house. Many in the empire began to adopt Greek customs to try and improve their social standing, while the ruling elites slowly adopt lo adopted local customs as well. Of course, this wasn't the only reason for building cities. For example, both Antigonus and Seleucus had built fortresses along their mutual border, owing to their obvious mistrust for one another. However, this problem remained even after Antigonus was killed at Ipsus in 301. Cities were built for defence. To understand why, we need to consider the strength and composition of Seleucus' army around this time. His army did not have a lot of infantry, unlike that of, say, Lysimachus, and was instead mainly focused on cavalry and elephants. The military system of the day depended on native Greeks, which was obviously a, pro obviously a problem for the Seleucids given their large distance from Greece itself. It was this lack of manpower that prompted Seleucus to create his four new cities in Syria, as well as six smaller settlements. Now, the Greeks were famous for their infantry, which is probably why this was attractive. As I've said, Seleucus' armies were mainly composed of cavalry and elephants, so attracting a few infantry over probably didn't hurt. As a quick aside, the construction in the reigns of Seleucus I and Antiochus I was one of two periods of city building, the second being under their descendant, Antiochus IV. Anyway, the idea of these towns was that they would become Greek colonies, from which phalanx or cavalry manpower could be drawn in the future. The creation of some of these settlements would go on to have consequences throughout the period and even beyond. Seleucia on the Tigris became an important centre for administration, along with the Anatolian town of Sardis. Antioch became the centre of government, as we've seen, while Seleuc Seleucia Pieria, also known in English as Seleucia by the Sea, was supposed to become Seleucus's most important harbour and a pathway to the wider Mediterranean world. So, to recap all of that. Seleucus was known as an energetic city builder, even among the successors. In the specific case of the Syrian Tetrapolis, he founded so many settlements in an attempt to shore up his control in the region, and encourage Greek settlers. Although in the short term, this was to bolster the ranks of his armies and one-up his rivals, the process of Greek settlement in the enormous and appealingly empty stretches of the Seleucid Empire saw many Greeks move there from their overcrowded homeland. This migration would see the region move towards Hellenization, and although rulers did start to meet them in the middle, Greek culture was still firmly preeminent over local culture. The cities Seleucus founded would remain consequential for centuries after he died. Although he might not have been imagining them existing in a world without the Seleucid Empire, I can imagine he wouldn't be upset by that consequential a legacy. As always, thank you all for listening. Feel free to get in touch with the show at afteralexpod at gmail.com for questions, comments, or even if you've got topic suggestions for future Divergence episodes that you'd like to see get their time in the limelight. Until next time, have a great week everyone.